Welcome everybody, welcome back to my channel. My name is James Jackson. Today, I am so excited to talk about Resolve 19. It is fully out of beta, it is fully utilized. And today I'm going to go into eight features of Resolve 19 specifically that I absolutely adore and I use on every single project since I've been doing the beta testing or since they came into the beta, test beta testing. Um, these are the eight features that I absolutely love. Um, some are quality of life things, but they make sure that, and I, I, I can't explain it. Um, but yeah, I, I'm super excited about Resolve 19. There it is, it, it, all the AI features that have come with it, all the different tool improvements to diff different workflows. It's been a joy, but these are the eight features that I pretty much use on a day-to-day -day basis uh, in my Resolve workflow. So without any further ado, let's go ahead and dive right into it. So the first one that I have to talk about is the Film Look Creator. Uh, I've already talked about this quite a few times, uh, but I cannot stress this enough about the Film Look Creator. I um, as someone who happens to use the Hanser a lot and loves uh, being able to create emulate film look, this thing is an absolute uh, joy to work with. As you'll see when we turn this back on, we've got basically all these different cool film building your whole look, uh, split tones, vignetting, halation, bloom, grain, flicker, gate weave, all of the like film uh, aesthetics are actually in DaVinci Resolve 19 built in. Now, um, in terms of getting a specific film look, like Kodak 2383 or Fujifilm uh, 5558 or 5855, um, I still think Dehancer is better because you can um, basically get it right there. It has presets built in. There's a lot of other things about it. But if you're just trying to get something that is a little bit more organic feeling, this is a great tool to have. I've already gone over most of the stuff um, with film emulation, uh, film look creator, uh, but you know it's been through quite a few changes. Um, and I talked about them in the last one, uh, as you will see here, this was the fact that we got the clean slate. Uh, and then all of, and also one of the things that we got was the fact that we can take off the film look and we can add that in. But as of beta five and now fully with the full res version of Resolve, we can now choose what our core look will be. So we got cinematic, which is the default one. Then you got Rochester, Akasaka, Elated, and Vintage. So here's Rochester. And I'm gonna bring this all in so you can really see the, the difference. So I'm gonna crank this all the way up. So this is the cinematic one. This is Rochester, Rochester, this is Akasaka, this is Elated, and this is Vintage. It's interesting that these are names of locations, and these are names of locations of very prominent uh, film, uh, film stocks. So Rochester is the, home, is the headquarters of Kodak, and Akasaka is the uh, headquarters for Fujifilm. Uh, so, if you are looking to get something that's inspirational of, say, Fujifilm 5525, you can start building that. And what I love about this is, like, you can kind of modify it how to I want. Uh, so, if you would like, obviously, Kodak 23, 2383, it's a very popular one. But you get to uh, decide how much of that will be affected, as you see here on the screen. So... In terms of just really truly building out your own unique film look, the Film Look Creator is an excellent tool to use for that. The next feature on my list that I have to talk about is the Color Slice. I am happy but incredibly upset by this because uh, if you guys are have been familiar with the plugin um, Mono Notes Hue Shift, this is literally Mono Notes Hue Shift built into Resolve. 
And I'm saying I'm happy that it's here because it works so easily. Um, pick, uh, Hue Shift never was a, an issue. Um, but uh, the fact that I just paid essentially, I believe, over $200 for the plugin, now I basically get essentially what that is for free right here. It's a bit of, anno it's a bit of annoying, but I'm, I'm glad it's been updated. So for those of you that maybe wonder what the color slice is, essentially it takes the subtractive saturation that you kind of start off getting in the Film Look Creator, but it allows you to open it up uh, right here. So essentially it's saturation adjustments, but it's on a but it does it in a subtractive matter. So for example, I could just go ahead and s everything is done in a subtractive. So I can basically just like crank the saturation I uh, want to, but as you can see, if you look at the waveforms, the intensity and the levels are not coming. Instead, what's happening is other colors are being pulled down. So you're getting a subtractive saturation. And then here you can adjust the balance of that, of where if you want something a bit more pushed to up towards it, so you want to add some um, or drop it down, you can do that. And then there's the depth. Or, or the density and the density is basically that allows you to sort of keep the uh, keep the colors going in control where you add um, there you get deeper deeper tones like the most promising as you'll see as I cr as I crank this up the reds get much much deeper um, and if you bring it down they get more vibrant so the fact that you can make these adjustments right here is incredible. And uh, obviously there's a little bit of spillage here, um, and, but that's something that you can correct. Uh, for something that's a 10-bit files, and we're kind of seeing it break a little bit over here. So I'm obviously pushing it to like the extreme. So let me bring that back down. And then pull, and let me bring this intense and bring this back up. So, but what's also cool is that you can then decide to go at the individual colors down here and you can highlight the portions that it will affect. So skin, yellow, red, green, yellow, cyan, blue, magenta. So if you get the technical aspects of it correct, if you balance your, if you balance your colors out properly, you can come in here and basically now you can highlight, uh, like say, okay, this red, uh, I wanna pull that down. So I can individually pull that down or I can say, hey, I only wanna in deepen the red. And uh, if I wanna go to green. Now, the interesting thing with green, especially when it comes to trees, and you'll see here, the yellow, when I go on yellow, it actually highlights most of the greens. The green parts are like the very deep greens, like those dark trees right there. So if you're ever dealing with like grass or something like that, it's best that you're most likely going to get more of that with uh, the yellow versus the green. It's just something to be aware of. But I use this essentially all the time. I actually uh, use this tool specifically after it came out. Um, I used on a full length feature documentary and I compared it to uh, pixel tools uh, Hue shift. So, and it works essentially identical. The center, you can readjust the center. You can even turn on the highlighter. So you can highlight a specific color that you want and you can make the adjustments how you want to. And then you can also shift the di of where the affected areas are going to be. So if you want it to go in a more targeted area, you could do that. And then uh, for this, you can move the tar you can move the target uh, to more of a specific area as well, and that's really something that I really really do love about the color slice. And again, I this is like one of my number one tools along with the Film Look Creator of Resolve 19 that I use on a daily basis. The next tool I want to talk about is something that. Uh, again, we're going to stay on the color page because I'm a colorist, but this has so simplified my workflow, so easy, um, and I'm so happy that it's here. And that 
is layered nodes. So if you look up here and you take a look at it, you will see that there's these different things, just L1, L2, L3. Well, if you go into your project settings and then you go to the general options, there's this new area called node stack layers. But essentially what this does is it breaks the clip portion of your of each individual clips and now you can put separate layers. So now you can make specific grades and specific targets for every single layer. So and you can have up to four layers, which is uh, more than enough, which is more than enough. So how does this how does this make this simplify? Well, if I wanted to basically build this look, build this look like right here, but I wanted to just add it across my timeline. Well, now I can go to this shot right here and then I can say, hey, apply the active layer or I can just reset this real quick. And then I'll say a pin grade. And if I pin grade and I'm on a specific layer, it's only going to pin that specific layer. So watch what happens. All of a sudden, I've got the same look that I've got across both. Now, essentially what I can do is if I have a look, a, a general look that I am going for either a set or a scene or a location or the look of the film, I can like a, a general look of the film. I can build a general look and basically just one click. If I was to highlight all this, I could just do one click and I can put that look across all of my clips on my timeline in one swell coup. Where before, in order to do that, you had to go put everything into groups, which was a bit more process intensive. Whereas here, it just layers things out. Uh, so typically what I like to do is I, I set layer one as my, um, as my correction layer. So I get my, I get all the things I need to adjust to get it into the right, uh, the right look. I do all of that in the first layer. So I do all my exposure adjustments, my white balancing, my color corrections, adjustments for skin. All of that is done on this first layer. And then layer two is where I build the look out. I build the general foundation of the look out. Then layer three is where if there's certain specific things of spe um, there's specific uh, adjustments I want to make. So like maybe I want to adjust the sky here or maybe there's a, an adjustment uh, uh, for a specific camera for the look. I'll use layer three as that adjustment layer. And then layer four is where I add um, I add sort of the finished touch-ups. I call the final touch-ups. So things like vignetting, uh, I'll do any sort of mask, any sort of masking I may do. Um, I'll any the sharpening, if um, any final grain, but the, anything to just build the look in the final that before it goes to the end of the pipeline. That's what I do in this layer. But the fact that I can do that and then I can add it all to each and individual layer, it's, it's amazing. Now, there is um, something that I will say you may want to be aware of when you're doing this, is that if you're doing, say, a mask, the mask has to be done on the last layer. Because if you try, so for example, I will have this right here. I'm going to, right now, as you can see, I have this like piece highlighted. So if I was to just turn that off for a second, if I was to go to layer one and I was to add an alpha out and then drag the alpha and then I'm gonna just paste it because I'd copied it. So if I paste that, that adjustment and then if you go, so you see that and then if you look here, you can see. But if you notice when I turn it off, nothing's happening. So you're already wondering, what the hell? Not, if you come across it, you'll be like, what the hell? Why is nothing happening? Well, it's because there's a whole bunch of other layers that kind of are not taking effect on this. You have to put it 
at the very end. So if you put it at the very end of the last layer, then I'll turn that back on. As you can see, the mask now works. So if you are going to use layered nodes, just remember any sort of masking you want to do at the very end or the last layer of how many layers you may have. The next feature I want to talk about is a feature that I've only started note using just recently, but it makes so much, it's a qu little quality of life on the color page. We're still on the color page, but it makes so much of a difference and I'm so happy here. And that is uh, normalizing channels on the RGB mixer. Now, if you've never used the RGB mixer, you're probably wondering what, um, what is that? Essentially is this part over here. So, you know, you have your primaries and then you got the HDR. And then over here, you got the RGB mixer. And essentially what this does is like, it allows you to make adjustments. So if I was just to take, I'm gonna turn these off for a second so you can see. But if I was to turn this off, it can really get wonky and you can really mess these colors up. But the thing with the RGB mixer is if you are trying to still have somewhat of a balance or white balance look, you had to sort of do calculations on each of the colors in order to keep a proper balance. Meaning if you add, let's say on the blue channel, like on the blue channel here, I had added 29. Well, if I am adding 29, because they, they have to level out. So in this case for the blue channel, if I am doing, uh, I add, let's say 28 on the blue, I have to take away the equivalent of 28 in the red and the green uh, to keep everything properly balanced. So what this does is allows you to click on these guys up here. And essentially what these do is they make sure that if you make any adjustments on either one, it properly adjusts for the other. So in this case, if I take away blue, it's adding to the red and the green. If I add blue, it's taken away from the red and the green. Now I can also take away green and push in those and push. So meaning I'm taking green out of the blue, uh, out of the blue, very similar to subtractive saturation. Uh, so what this allows to do is like you can push the colors. It allows you to adjust the scene and gives you more colors to play with. And it's just a simple quality of life, but it makes so much easier when you don't have to actually worry about the calculations of, uh, of, of doing it for each scene. So the next thing I wanna talk about is on the edit page. And I, oh my gosh, this is such a time saver. Uh, and what I am talking about is transcripted timelines. Now, on the edit page, and you know, since Resolve 18.5, uh, DaVinci Resolve has had something called uh, transcript audio, where it will basically uh, create a generate a transcription, a text-based transcription of the audio from a clip, and it was very awesome because it allowed you to isolate and cut it. It was also kind of tedious because it essentially made it very very difficult to just because you had to go there, you had to then put it in, insert it, find another clip. Well, now what? is happening is that you can now transcript from an actual timeline. So now I can transcript the timeline right here. And what's awesome is that now it also gives me names. What's awesome is that with this, I can do things, I uh, can automatically edit things so I can remove silent portions, which you could do before. But now watch what happens when I do that it now cuts and trims. So all the silent portions is done. So, and then let's say, hey, I'm trying to get rid of this, the, sis, uh, the speaker, which is the, let's just say that's the director or the questionnaire. I can come in, I can delete, it'll highlight it, and then I'll delete it. And then I can also come back here again, remove silent portions, boom. And now I can actually edit. And in especially for interviews, as interviews is such a big thing in my field. I can now edit a whole interview uh, we're speaking with the director or, or, the, or the client where we having the things that we want to focus on, that we want to highlight, we can just go right in and I can chop it up right here. It saves us so much time in the edit post, especially if you're dealing with long form interviews. It's not. It's not perfect. You still got to make some tweaks, but it does save you so much time. So you can, if you want to, you can trim all this down 
and make it and you can just find it down so you can really fine tune it to how you want to and I like the fact that it gives you the time so if you do know hey we need to get this under five minutes you know when you've hit a five minute mark obviously you can see up here but on the transcript you can see where okay we'll go after you as you edit it and torque it down I this 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 right here is it, there's many game changers. This is one of the big game changers because now I can just tweak and go in and just put all the put all the footage I'm going to be using on the timeline, and then I could just cut cut and just use it. The next one I want to talk about is the AI audio tools that we we got now in DaVinci Resolve 19. Now AI audio tools have been around since 18.5. We got the voice isolator, which you heard me talk about it in my previous Resolve. Uh, videos. I love it. It's absolutely duels. Um, and it's been v much improved in Resolve 19, but there's a bunch of other new features that I want to talk about. So if we go to here and we go to the audio section, we now have uh, voice isolation. We got our, we got dialogue leveler, which were all there before. Now we have something called dialogue separator. So now you can have it where we can just highlight only uh, we can get rid of that background so we can get the really obvious and because um, I thought it was perhaps an isolated event um, I knew she was young and that was not normal which is very similar to what it does with the, with the uh, voice isolation I still think in terms of if you're trying to build a track that's specifically a dialogue one and you want to get rid of the background I still prefer the voice isolator just my personal opinion but what this does do is if, hey, I want to take out the voice and I want to leave the background, I can now do that. So where would you use something like that where you would take out the voice? Well, let's say you're maybe in the city and maybe you want to get some room tone. If you, or maybe I, if you forgot room tone, you, sh you messed up as an audio person. But if for some reason you did and you had these dialogues, what you could do is essentially you can build a room tone uh, using this. You can just take out the voice and basically have that as a separate layer. And then you can just use the background stuff and sort of fill, create that filler as sort of like a room tone. Another new tool that we have of the AI audio is the Ducker. So this will sit here, share the source, which is audio one. And then what you use is you, they'll use this as the Ducker. So I am going to, and I'm where you can make adjustments. So I'm gonna turn this off for a second, so you'll hear what it sounds like. Um, I believe I was first diagnosed with high cholesterol in about the year 2015. The number was four. All right. So now let's see what happens when I turn the audio with the ducker on. Um, I believe I was first diagnosed with high cholesterol in about the year 2015. The number was 475 total cholesterol, if I remember correctly. And, and what's cool about it is. And what's cool about it is you can basically choose uh, the lock, make more advanced options where you can see how long if you want to hold it between in between. So that's another great thing. The next one, and I, I, I use this constantly all the time, and I'm so happy it's finally here, is the music remixer. So if you've had if you've had uh, music, but there's maybe a certain part that comes on that feels like it just bit out of place. So let's just do this. All right, so we notice that there's some voices uh, in the dialogue. So what we can do now is say, hey, we didn't really want that. Now, when this first came out, I, I kind of had my issues with it because you can only make the adjustments on the track level, not clip level. And the reason why it was a problem, because you would then have to be forced to make several additional tracks, thereby making the processor more intensified. Um, and because it could only do it on a track level, so you had to separate them. Now, you don't have to. What you could do now is you can cut, and let's, and let's say that portion, I, I'm like, I just want to get the voice out of that section. So now I can go here, I can go to the music remixer, and I say, mute the voice. Or, or let's say, instead of doing that, I'm going to bring it down. So let's see the difference. Because now we can essentially extend an audio track if 
for some reason we need to make it go longer and we want very specific parts but we want only specific parts of a or certain specific instruments for that part this is so much handful the only other critique i may have is i really wish there was a there's more sources so like right now you got guitars you got bass you got drums and voice and then there's other i wish there was something for like strings for sax for percussions to just help us pull out specific more specific things but i'm being nick peak this is a great start for that the next one i want to talk about is something that you probably didn't notice or didn't or, or, or probably didn't recognize and that is the center lock it was one of the things that always bothered me is that if i wanted to scroll the track if i wanted to scroll the track i always had to out of I may lose sight of the track now I can scroll across a timeline and it's the the highlighter is staying directly center which is how I prefer to edit this is a little quality of life thing but this is something I greatly appreciate it is definitely one of my favorite features and last but certainly not least is the resolve cloud collaboration with proxy workflows so with Resolve 19 and all, all, with Blackmagic making big, big, big strides into moving into more cloud collaboration as is with so many other um, different companies, Blackmagic has really, really hit the nail and really, really uh, gone out of the park with this one. And what essentially what I'm talking about is if you're doing a cloud collaboration like this is, what now happens is every single time you, you put a clip or put any sort of... of uh, media source into the cloud collaboration project resolve will automatically generate proxies and send it to the cloud so as you can see here how those proxies are being generated as we speak what makes this so great is the fact that now i can keep all of the original files and then if I say I have an editor, I want to just only deal with the color grading. I want to come in and deal with the color grading, so that's why I'll have the original files. But I can generate proxy files. All the other person has to do is just sign into Blackmagic Cloud. I just give them the invite key. They come on. The files are right there. All of the files, as long as, as, long as I have every single file there, I just all, he has everything to do to edit. And then for me, the color grade, I have everything there. So, and then once all that, so I get my portion done, I grade, I can go export it and then send it. Uh, or if I'm doing, I need a sound mixer, I can just have the sound mixer go and do everything there. As long as it's right there on the timeline, all the proxies are generated. So it makes it so much easier where we don't have to worry about transmitting hard drive files. It just makes the collaboration work so much easier. So there you have it guys, those are my top eight features of Resolve 19. I would love to know what is your favorite Resolve 19 features. I've been having a blast with it, but I would love to know and hear from you. Let me know, leave your comments down below. And as always, make sure to hit that subscribe button. And until next time, take care everyone.